All right, welcome to dun, da, 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 the Find the Human game. So we're about to play a game where you will get to see if you can pick which one of these embryos at the approximate same stage of embryonic development is the human. Hmm, that's a tough one, right? Because they all look so similar, and in fact, they are. So what we're about to do is a piece of evidence for macroevolution called comparative embryology. It's called comparative embryology because by comparing embryos at the same relative stage of development of different species of vertebrates, we can kind of retrace our evolutionary heritage. If we all shared a common ancestor, we should all go through the same kinds of developmental stages. And in fact, that's the case. So ready? All right, I'm going to give you three seconds to vote. So vote for the human. One, two, three. Ta-da! All right, are you ready? So. If you voted for this last one over here, you voted for a chicken. If you voted for the one next to him, you voted for a fish. If you voted for the first one, you voted for a rabbit. If you voted for the, this one, you voted for a salamander. Here's a turtle. And finally, here's the human. How many of you got it the first try? Didn't think so. So it's kind of interesting because, I mean, and you can see that the ones that are closer related in evolutionary time look even more similar to each other. Like, check out the fish and the salamander. Check out the human and the other mammal on here, the rabbit. And then here's a turtle and a chicken. So, you know, if we shared a common ancestor, we'd all go through the same kinds of stages of development. And in fact, it's true. Even we humans, at about five weeks gestation, means five weeks into um, the mother's pregnancy, we have a tail. Yes, I had a tail. You had a tail. We all had tails. Most of us are not born with tails because enzymes will get expressed that eat away the tail before birth. Although once in a while, as you heard in our atavistic lecture, those enzymes uh, do not get expressed and the default is to grow a tail. Uh, so um, not only a tail, how crazy is this? We also have open pharyngeal notches. Those become gills in fish, but they basically close up and become, um, become part of the throat in mammals and reptiles. And I'll show you in a little bit where you actually see people that were born with open pharyngeal slits. It's crazy. So again, this is evidence for macroevolution because if we shared a common ancestor, then all the descendants should, should go through the same kinds of development as embryos. So this line of evidence is called comparative embryology, where we compare the embryos across different species. So there's kind of a phrase you can say to remind us of this, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Ontogeny means, uh, it refers to development or developmental stages. Recapitulates means retraces, and phylogeny means our evolutionary heritage. So in other words, our evolutionary heritage um, is, re is reminded or retraced by looking at our stages of development. So embryos resemble each other at each phylotypic, means of each evolutionary stage. So that's a piece of evolution um, evidence called comparative embryology. So embryology is obviously a fascinating field for being able to study um, possibly how organisms had evolved over time, how you can get speciation. So a little more on embryology um, regarding what happens during embryonic development, like check out whales. These guys are so cute. And of course, some whale species like this killer whale have teeth. Others have lost their teeth, like the bottlenose dolphin that you see down here. But if you study the embryos of, embryos of these guys, you see some amazing developmental traits. Check this out. During the development of the embryos of these whales, they get structures that would have been present in their ancestral species, like land mammals that were their ancestors, and then they lose them before they're born, kind of like we humans get a tail and then we lose it before we're born. For example, whales as embryos develop body hair. Um, they develop um, external limb buds, like check this out. This is a whale embryo and he's at about what would be five weeks um, development in humans. And check this out, he has frontal limbs and even hind limbs. 
But whales, of course, adult whales, most of them do not have legs. Although, as we learned in the atavistic structure video, once in a while you'll have an adult who these things didn't get eaten away and they developed limbs. So amazing. Why develop these limb buds if they weren't just retracing their evolutionary heritage because their ancestors did develop limbs? I just think that is the coolest thing since Swiss cheese. Um, not only the limb buds, they also end up having nostrils that start off where they are with us, like a nose in the front of the face, and during embryonic development, they actually migrate up to the top of the head. Because we know that um, whales and dolphins, they actually um, will blow water out of the top of their head and they really breathe through the top of their head. So these nostrils just uh, end up fusing into one blowhole, but they, they actually can watch them migrate during embryonic development. So amazing. Again, they would have inherited nostrils from their ancestors. They carry the genes for having nostrils in the front of the face, but they end up migrating during development to the top of the head. That is so cool. They also have ear pineals. In other words, holes where ears would go. These guys don't usually do much hearing under the water other than sonar, but they still will develop just as if they were gonna be regular ears, and then they um, end up turning into what adult whales would have. Um, although in some atavistic uh, individuals, you may still have some actual um, ears that, that stay instead of closing up during development. And uh, in teeth whales, like the killer whale, so, and then not only that, teeth. So as I mentioned, some whales, like killer whales, have teeth. Other whales, the baleen whales, have lost their teeth. Yet, during embryonic development, they can actually produce teeth, and then they lose the teeth before they're born. Again, evolution retracing what happened over time. So back to uh, these pharyngeal pouches. I mentioned that um, all vertebrates as embryos have these slits, these pharyngeal pouches um, on their necks. So uh, here's kind of what it would look like in an embryo. Here is a human, an adult human, and you can see where different, different arches, brachial arches, become different structures in the adult human. So for humans, we end up closing up the slits and they develop into other structures. In fish, they end up developing into um, actual gills. But once in a while, you have, um, for example, in humans, you'll have these arches not completely close up, and then you actually end up with adults that have, um, let me move my picture out of the way here. You have adults, actually, I'll move me down here. You'll have adults that end up with these open brachial slits or pharyngeal pouches that then must get uh, sewed up. Uh, so amazing. I mean, we still have the same genes that close up and make these kinds of structures in us are the same genes that will end up coding for gills in fish. How cool is that? So um, some other evidence for uh, macroevolution comes from molecular evidence where you can just see the same genes in a human, in a goat, in a cow, in a dog, in a whatever, and you'll end up getting um, the same kinds of genetic deformities forming in all these different species because they're based on the same um, malfunctioning genes. So for example, there's a, a gene a mutation that codes for a disease called cyclopia. And this disease is kind of what it sounds like. It's where basically the eyes have fused into one area. There's often um, malformations of other parts of the face. And they tend to also um, have problems with the organs. Sometimes the organs are produced on the outside of the body. Uh, generally, these individuals end up being stillborn or uh, miscarriages. They, they don't develop into adults. But here's cyclopia in a human, and here it is in a goat, and here it is in, um, a, I believe, a cow. Uh, you can find it on, in a cat, in a dog. It's really interesting that the same gene mutation, the same change in the DNA, codes for the same disease in all of these organisms. So very, very interesting, and they believe this disease is where the Cyclops fable might have come from. But again, it shows lineage. It shows that we had a common ancestor, and thus we have the same gene. And the same change to that gene causes the same trait in all these different species. So these kinds of things are called genetic homologies. Uh, moving my weirdo talking head back over here. Um, so a genetic homology means that you see the same gene or genes 
in many different species, um, even across groups, so not just within the vertebrates, but the same gene present in an invertebrate and a vertebrate, a human and an invertebrate like a fruit fly. We have the exact same genes, the same DNA code are very, very similar and produces similar traits. So for example, uh, one of the most studied genetic homologies is a group of genes called Hox genes. And these Hox genes are homeotic genes. They've discovered code for segments of the body during embryonic development. So for example, if you look at this, this would be a fruit fly embryo. Drosophila is the genus of fruit flies. And each of these colors represents a different gene, a different Hox gene. So for example, the Hox gene in green codes for the tail segment. Uh, the Hox gene in blue codes for this part of the head segment. Uh, the body, main part of the body, the abdomen and thorax is coded by these orange ones. And so, you know, the, the orange ones would code, for example, making legs and wings. Um, and so they've actually done creepy, like Frankenstein kind of studies where you can take a Hox gene for making legs from the middle of a fly embryo and go and insert them into the head region. And lo and behold, what do you get? Legs growing out of the head of the fruit fly. How crazy is that? They've done other similar ones where you can take the Hox genes for making eyes from the head, stick it in the middle of the embryo, and you get legs with eyes growing on them. Yes, that is true. And um, what's also cool is to take a look at these Hox genes and compare them to the Hox gene um, sequence in humans and mice and all sorts of things. So they've also been able to go and take, um, make a, a strain of flies that are called eyeless, where they don't have eyes. And you can then go and take the Hox genes for making eyes from a mouse embryo, insert it into the head region of an embryo for a fly, for an eyeless fly, and the fly will end up growing fly eyes by reading the mouse gene. So in other words, our Hox genes are so similar that a fly can read a mouse gene for eyes perfectly, but make compound fly eyes like this from a mammal eye gene. That is just so crazy.